with all of you. Yes, Paul needed their help. He needed their help in prayerful support. He needed their help in financial support. And it was their privilege to humbly and sacrificially give to be able to meet those needs. Now, by way of direct application today, uh, we need to pray for our missionaries and uh, for their ministries. Uh, we uh, need to remember them, not just on Wednesdays, but throughout the week and to keep at our home. Uh, uh, you know, we've put out lists of the different uh, missionaries that we do have. Particularly today when Bob comes to pray, I'd like to remember four of our missionaries. These four because they are particularly, in a sense, I would say, on the front lines doing evangelism. We have the Clarks and the Lynns in Brazil. And uh, they need our prayer as they do evangelism, as they do church planning, and as they do face opposition. And then I think about the Kutlarsics and the Hadleys, who are both in Japan. The Hadleys working through the school system, and uh, the Kutlarsics working through a camp system to uh, pour forth the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. And so it would be very appropriate of us today as we pray to uh, pray for these families in particular who are directly doing evangelism. We need to be ready to exhort, to encourage, and to help each other. And we need to realize that God has called us to pray and to pray particularly for those who are in missions and ministry, that God will uphold them and that God will further their ministry. The first trip for this tourist to New York. And of course, uh, as we've all heard, New York is uh, not the friendliest of towns. And so uh, this tourist determined that uh, she was going to be friendly to everyone. And uh, she was picked up from the airport by a cabbie in the dark of the night. She sat in the back and thought to herself, how can I be friendly and greet? As she sat in the back of the cab, she decided uh, she would say hello to the cab driver. And so she reached out and she tapped his shoulder to say hello. Well, the cabbie screams, loses control of the car, uh, almost hits a bus, swerves around another car, goes up on the sidewalk, and almost goes through the plate glass window showroom of one of the department stores. For a second, everything is quiet in the cab. Then the driver looks back and says, Look, friend, don't ever do that again. You scared the daylights out of me. She apologizes and said that she didn't realize that a little tap on the shoulder would have scared him like that. She was simply trying to be friendly. The driver, after gathering himself together, said, You know, you're right. I'm sorry. It's my fault. Today is my first day of driving a cab. Previous to this, for 25 years, I've driven a Hearst. <laughs> if everybody's had time to get that. <laughs> Open up your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 16, where the Apostle Paul greets... 27 people by name and many others by general reference. In this passage, we will see that Paul commends Phoebe and then greets the saints in Rome and creates a kind of a family or community as he closes out his epistle. Romans chapter 16, verse 1, he says, I commend you, our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sancria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help that she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. 
Now, we need to remember that the Apostle Paul does not toss around compliments without them being genuine. The Apostle Paul had no trouble saying of other people that uh, they have forsaken me or uh, they seek their own interests, not the interests of Christ, that those around me have abandoned me. So in these greetings and in these statements, uh, this is not just the Apostle Paul being nice, it's the Apostle Paul being truthful and genuine. And this uh, precious sister in the Lord, Phoebe, was a great help to him and to others. And she was on her way to Rome, and he wanted the community of faith to encourage her, to help her along in her plans, just as he had hoped that they would help him someday. Now, I want to pause for just a moment from what I would call a uh, plain exposition of the text to talk about a theological matter for a moment. For it is this text, Romans 16, chapter, 16, chapter, uh, chapter 16, verse 1, that has been used by many to suggest that there is an office of deaconess or an office of eldership for women equal to that which Paul talks about in his pastoral epistles. And so it's a controversial passage theologically when Paul says, I commend to you my sister Phoebe, a servant of the church. Maybe your translation says a deaconess of the church. The Greek word was used in a specific technical way, we would say, to speak of the elders of the church and the deacons of the church. It's used this way in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 8 through 12. But the word is also used in a general sense as the New International Version has translated this. In Romans 15, 8, he calls other people servants. In 1 Corinthians 3, 5, he speaks of us being servants of God. And so the question is whether we take this uh, uh, in the technical sense that what Paul is doing here is establishing an office of rulership, an office within the church uh, for Phoebe called that of a deaconess, equal to deacons, or whether he's referring to it in a general sense. There's a principle of interpretation that when there is an unclear passage, you allow the clearer passages to speak and influence it for the correct interpretation. So if there's some ambiguity here, we say, well, are there other passages that speak to this issue that may speak to it more clearly? And there are two that I particularly would like to draw our attention to today. Open up your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. Now, I think we need to keep in mind that within the context of God establishing maleness and femaleness and, uh, and order within his church and order within his creation, that order does not mean that there's a superiority and an inferiority but there are simply different roles, and both roles are vitally important. But in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, I also want women to dress, to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Now, uh, generally speaking, in ancient Near East, uh, women all dressed modestly to today's standards because they were completely covered and often their head and face was covered with veils. But on special occasions, they would braid through their hair strands of gold or silver. Uh, can you imagine the work that that would be, ladies? And uh, pearls and other gems. And it would simply draw attention to themselves. And uh, Paul says, you know, in the church and in the point of worship and instruction, uh, the focus should be on God. The focus should be on lifting up Jesus Christ and not on drawing attention to ourselves, whether it's a new dress or a new suit or whatever. When we come for corporate worship, the Lord God is our focus. Verse 2 or verse 10 of chapter 2, 1 Timothy. He says, But it should be with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Verse 11, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. 
Well, these are very unpopular terms in today's Western culture. It almost sounds a little bit uh, Taliban-ish, doesn't it? Verse 12, Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Now, the word here for man is under the adult man. This doesn't mean children. Paul is not saying that women don't have a vital ministry in the church, that women can't teach women, that women can't teach children. Uh, they have the greatest influence in our world, particularly because of their influence for our children. But Paul is saying within the context of the local church, within the context of, of the uh, worship and the leadership, that women are not to teach adult men and they are not to have authority over a man. Now, if there was the office of deaconess, which was equal to the office of deacon, you would have a conflict in scriptures here, for they are people who are given authority over others. 1 Timothy 2.13, Paul says, For Adam was first, and then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and propriety. And so Paul lays down church order, and within that church order, he says that women are not to teach nor exercise authority over men. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 through 40. Now, there are those that argue that, well, what we have here is just old, archaic culture. Uh, these are cultural practices that uh, should be uh, eliminated today because women weren't educated in that day. They didn't have access to the synagogue training. And uh, this was just uh, the Apostle Paul's uh, chauvinistic attitude and mindset. Now, if we follow the principle that we do not have to follow this because it's a cultural pattern, then where do you stop throwing things out? <laughs> you know, you could say marriage and divorce laws back then were a cultural pattern. Uh, you could say uh, that uh, uh, murder was a cultural pattern. I mean, you could go on and on. You could talk about sexual roles uh, were just cultural patterns of maleness and femaleness. The question really is not when is something cultural, but when is it so clearly taught that it transcends culture? Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, Paul says, Women should remain silent or quiet in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Now, within the context of 1 Corinthians 14, we're looking at the revelatory gifts, the preaching, the teaching, the prophecy, the speaking in tongues, and the giving of revelation. And within that context of communication from God and uh, that learning experience, the Apostle Paul says, you know, there's a creative order that I've established uh, from the very beginning. It's called the home. It's called the husband-wife relationship. And that's a relationship that I want to nurture and develop. And we need to develop that by men taking responsibility for the spiritual leadership in their home. And therefore, Paul says, if a woman has a question, let her ask her husband. He should be challenged to cause the family to grow. Verse 36, he says, did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people that have received it? If anybody thinks that he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. This isn't Paul's personal opinion. This isn't his chauvinistic uh, Jewish uh, uh, background. This is what the Apostle Paul has received from the Lord Jesus himself. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Just because something's cultural, you can't throw it out. When a teaching command or practice 
transcends culture. It transcends it, first of all, because it's rooted in the creative order. And in both of these passages, when the Apostle Paul talks about the role of men and women in the church in relationship to adult men and women, he goes back to the book of Genesis. He goes back to creative order. And he says, this is founded in the establishment of God. Anytime you look at a practice and it transcends the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's a practice in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's something that transcends culture. You just can't throw it out. Anything that's grounded in the moral character of God or something that was practiced widely by all the churches is something that we ought to practice also. When we look at cultural practices, we say, well, is this a cultural statement of what they did or of what we are also to do? And I think to take this one little phrase, Phoebe, a servant, and try to create out of that an entire restructuring of church history and church theology and the church order in light of these clearer passages would be improper. Again, that's not to say that one is superior or another is inferior. The Bible says the one who desires the office of an elder desires a good thing, but they also desire a difficult thing. They desire a burdensome thing. They desire a thing with great accountability and not to be sought after lightly. Romans chapter 16, now verses 3 and 4. Paul will go on to greet others. He says, Greet uh, Priscilla, or Prisca, may be one translation. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. You remember this uh, Priscilla and Aquila from the book of Acts? It was uh, Priscilla and Aquila who were driven out of Jerusalem during the uh, persecutions and who had to leave and flee the city. Uh, they met Paul uh, on his way from Athens to Corinth. And because they both had a, a similar trade, sometimes it's translated tent maker, but you know, in the city of Corinth, you don't need tents, but you do need a whole lot of sails in a port city. Uh, they were uh, fabric workers. They were, in a sense, uh, uh, seamstress or canvas workers. And so they worked together and they stayed together and they reasoned in the synagogue together, trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks to believe in the Lord Jesus. It was uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila who bumped into Apollos, this gifted homiletician, this man who was out preaching what he knew of uh, John the Baptist's ministry and uh, who didn't know everything about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it was Aquila and Priscilla who pulled him aside and said, Apollos, let's bring you up to date. And they were a great encouragement and teacher and a ministry to Apollos. It was, uh, I'm sure, Priscilla and Aquila when the riots broke out uh, in the city of Ephesus, when uh, the Apostle Paul wanted to storm in to the center of the city, into the uh, uh, theater, and uh, proclaim Christ in the midst of this riot, that uh, I'm sure that they were some of those who said, Paul, stay back, stay back, it's too risky. We will go in, and we will see what we can do. And they put their own lives on the line. Yes, as the Apostle Paul thought about Priscilla and Aquila, they were fellow workers, they were people who were willing to risk their lives for him and for others. And they had such a testimony that the churches of the community were very grateful for their ministry. Romans chapter 16, verse 5. He says, greet also the church that meets at their house. They had a church that met in their house. Now, how big could that church be in their house? How many people could you fit into your house? You know, there's sometimes we get this idea and, uh, you know, the churches have got to be huge, that we've got to have, you know, hundreds of, and thousands of people. And I think churches ought to grow, and I 
pray and hope that uh, we might continue to reach out to the community and grow. But the size of the church is not the main thing. The community, the spiritual culture, and the growth of the church is more. And uh, this was a church that was of faith and communion that met in their house. Paul says, greet my dear friend Epinesis who was the first convert to Christ in the providence of Asia. Well, you know, what a neat thing to be the first convert uh, in a continent. Some of you have maybe been the first convert in your family, maybe on your block. Verse 6, greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet uh, Andronicus and Junius, my relatives, the NIV translation says. Maybe your translation says, my kinsman. Uh, this word can mean uh, somebody of the same nationality, like we're U.S. citizens together, or it can mean somebody who is actually a relative, a cousin, or something like that. I would translate this as relatives of the Apostle Paul because there are other Jewish people in this list who are not called kinsmen. Uh, and not identified with this particular extra term. So uh, Paul's got a couple relatives in Rome. My relatives who have been in prison with me, they are outstanding amongst the NIV says apostles. Now the word apostle is another word like the word uh, servant or deacon that can be used in a technical term or in a general term. Somebody who was sent on a mission is an apostle. And then there were the 12 apostles. Uh, here, it's in the general sense. Uh, greet those who are apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. These are a couple of men who became believers in Jesus Christ before the Apostle Paul. Verse 8, greet Amplitus, whom I love in the Lord. It's interesting, this particular name is uh, found in the city of Rome. It was a popular name amongst the aristocracy, the royal family. Uh, it's a common name that is found amongst the Christian uh, catacombs. And uh, there is a particular Christian family plot from the first century in Rome uh, after this particular name. Greet uh, Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend uh, Stachys. Greet Apollos, tested and approved in Christ. Wow, can you imagine how encouraged this person must have felt when he heard the Apostle Paul say that? You know, this is a person who's been tested. And they've passed the test and they're approved in Christ. And uh, greet those who belong to the house of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Now, uh, we don't know if this Herodian was uh, one of the uh, descendants or family member of uh, Herod. Herod the Great had his uh, three sons, and they used this name very often. Uh, greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Uh, ancient documents tell us about a man in the city of Rome by the name of Narcissus. He was a very wealthy man. He had purchased his wealth and become a free man. Uh, he was very influential underneath the reign of Claudius to uh, bring about many good uh, social government kinds of projects. Uh, but it also tells us that underneath the reign of Nero that uh, somehow he had ticked off Nero's mother because uh, she had him put to death. I think I might remember that he was beheaded. So uh, narcissists is maybe somebody we know about. Uh, verse 12, greet uh, Tryphena and Tryphosa, uh, those women who work hard in the Lord. Uh, Tryphena and Tryphosa may be uh, uh, twins, for it was not uncommon, uh, just like today, when you have twins, that you give them two similar sounding names uh, to drive them crazy and everybody else for the rest of their lives. Greet my dear friend Persis, Another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Now, notice in the midst of this how many men and how many women. And they are all vitally involved in the ministry and the work that the Apostle Paul has, even though they have different roles. 
and different ministries. Verse 13, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Now, we know from Mark chapter 15 and verse 21 that when Jesus Christ was being taken out to be crucified, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, who was identified as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Uh, he's identified by his sons, not by his own father, which would be normal. So there must have been something significant about Rufus and Alexander that their father is identified with him. They probably became leaders in the church in some way. And of course, maybe this Rufus is the same one. As Jesus was passing along, you remember, and he fell underneath the burden of the cross, Simon was asked to carry it. Greet a syncretus, Phlegon, Hermas, Patropas, Hermas, and the brothers with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nerurus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, here we have another example of, is this a pattern of culture, or is this a pattern for culture? In uh, ancient Near Eastern uh, cultures, and even today, you see men greeting each other with a kiss. It's called a holy kiss, a sincere kiss. It's supposed to be a kiss of peace, a kiss of friendship. Of course, uh, Judas shared that same kiss with the Lord Jesus Christ on the night in which he betrayed them. Uh, is this something that we should be doing? When we come through the doors, should we be... I see some heads shaking. So, yeah, I don't want to kiss you either. So, but see, it, it, a good principle uh, to understand these kinds of things is, is it practiced in the Gospels? Is it seen as part of the church in the book of Acts? And is it elaborated on as a command in the epistles? Now, some would say, well, you know, this is something we need to do, but in our culture, it would send the wrong message. What we do today is we greet each other with a handshake. In, uh, in uh, Asian countries or, uh, for instance, Japan or something, you would greet one another with a bow. And so sometimes a principle can be translated and transferred into something more acceptable within the same culture. But we are to greet one another with the sincerity of the holy kiss. And this meant it was the kiss of peace. It was a pattern in which they acknowledged their unity. And certainly that is something that we should always have in the church. That when we come to worship God, that we are united in heart and in spirit. Paul says, all the churches of Christ send greetings. Twenty-seven people, Paul mentions by name, and he hasn't even been to the place yet. People that he's come across and that he knows, friends who are coming and going throughout Rome, showing that, that within the Christian community, Paul has taken time to get to know each other. Uh, that's what we need to do as a family. We need to keep getting to know each other. And, of course, we've given those opportunities through small groups. We have that opportunity as in September, we will celebrate another communion supper together. But I'm wondering, what would the greetings be if a letter was written by someone from, uh, that was away at Berean Bible Church or somebody from Berean Bible Church? Open up to that little insert that I give you. And uh, I want you to open it up, and at the bottom, there's a little bit of a note there with some things to fill in. I want you to take a pencil or a pen and it says, Dear brother and sister in Christ, greet and then put your name down there. Greet whatever your name is in the faith. Write that in. And then after that, write your name again. So-and-so's ministry of and then write down what it is that you do for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Dear brother and sister in Christ, greet so-and-so in the faith. So-and-so's ministry of whatever has been a blessing to the body of Christ. What can you write in? What would, what would if it was the Apostle Paul, you know, writing about our church and about each and every one of us, what would he say? Could he say that we're hard workers? Could he say that we've been willing to risk our lives for others? Uh, can he say that we've been uh, diligent and faithful? Uh, that we have labored in toil? What, what would be said about us? Now, if for some reason you can't fill in that so-and-so's ministry of has been a blessing to the body of Christ, well then, you're missing something. You're missing the joy of being used by God. You're missing the blessing of God doing something wonderful for, through you to others. And the answer is to get involved to give us a call, to sit down with the elders, to sit down with somebody and say, you know what, I haven't been doing much. I really do need to do something. Uh, for the Lord wants us all to have a ministry. We all have spiritual gifts. And I want to do something. What do you think I can do? Uh, what training can you give me? How can you help me get involved in the work of the ministry? For someday... A, statement and epitaph is going to be written and it's going to be read in heaven each and every one of us should want to hear well done thou good and faithful servant enter into the joy of the lord ministry is part of spiritual growth ministry is part of worship to the lord ministry should be a part of every believer in jesus christ and so let us commit ourselves to community let us commit ourselves to team effort, and that each and every one of us would step forward and say, what can I do within the church? What can I do within the community? What can I do within the body of Christ to be of ministry and a blessing to others?